The Holy Gospel for the day is taken from the 24th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Luke. And I'm going to invite you to remain seated for the reading of the Gospel. Unlike my usual instruction, I'm going to ask you to read along because there's parts for you to read. And so please follow the instructions. Now on that same day, the day of the resurrection, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood sit still, looking sad, then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered, He asked them what things they replied. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. And they came near the village to which they were going. He walked ahead as if he were going on, but they urged him strongly, saying, So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were open, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray for the blessing of the Spirit to anoint the word. Come Holy Spirit, come. Settle over us. Transform our lives. Help us, O oh Lord, to have ears that are open to you hearts that are willing to find you and see you and seek you. Be with us, Lord, that this would be your word for us today. Amen. On display in the world-famous Louvre Museum in Paris, France, is a painting by Goethe called Faust. The painting is intriguing and dramatic. It depicts Faust sitting on one side of a table playing a very in-depth game of chess with Satan. And it looks as if when you look at it on first blush that Satan is about to win. It looks like the, the whole game is going to come down to a win for Satan. And in fact, if you look at Satan's features, you see that. He's delighted. He's leering and glaring and just really looks like he's ready to pounce on this guy. You could almost imagine as you look at the painting that Satan is about to shout, checkmate, game over, you lose, I win, it's all finished, final victory. But if you look more closely, you find there is something else there. 
Several years ago, a world-famous chess player was there admiring the painting, and he's looking at it for a long period of time, and all of a sudden he just sort of lunges forward and says, oh my gosh, look at this, Faust has one more move, and when he makes it, he will win, the victory will be his. I'm fairly certain that on the night of the crucifixion, Satan and the forces of evil and death thought they had a winner. They thought it was their deal. They were probably shouting all around, checkmate, game over, we win, you lose. It's all over, the victory is ours. But you see, when you look more deeply, they are just deceiving themselves. And really, after all, since we deceive ourselves as a function of our sin, why shouldn't we recognize that the great deceiver himself is one who succumbs also to self-deceit? Because the victory is going to be God's, and it will be God's. In a very short time, the very next move that God makes will ensure that victory. God will raise Jesus from the dead. And from that time on, Satan and his players may think they're still in the game, but the reality is they've lost. The victory has been won for God. It may not yet look like permanent victory, but it is. It's the last word on every human existence. It's the final word on your life and mine. Luke tells us that on the, on the day of the resurrection, but before the disciples had seen the risen Christ, two of Jesus' followers are on their way to Emmaus. Emmaus. It's a fairly long walk. Seven miles, that's a pretty reasonable walk for people. A lot of time to discuss things. And, you know, you can just imagine the last three days have been no picnic for them. They didn't experience those days as God's awakening miracle for human life. That was not their particular experience. One day they would know that it was. But for them, the last three days have seemed like nothing but endless horror. You can almost imagine the slump of their shoulders. And even if it wasn't there physically, it would have been there in their souls. I've been with lots of folks around the time of dying, and I can tell you that slump is there, even if you don't see it physically. It's in our souls, it's in our hearts, it's in our moods. It's just in us when we are experiencing death in our midst. And Luke tells us as they walk along, they talk about all the things that have been happening to them. That's also right. Every time I've been around a family who's lost a loved one, there's loads of conversation about that loved one. We just need to talk about it. It's how we work on it. It's how we keep that person alive in our lives. It's the way that we keep thinking about them. It's the way that we begin the process of healing. So it's a natural thing that they do, this talking about it. Surely they must have talked about that Passover meal. Nothing like that had ever happened to them. I mean, nobody had ever taken the common bread, the bread that was saved and set aside as a symbol that you would have bread prepared for when you were going to be taken on out of slavery and led out of the country of Egypt. Nobody had ever taken that bread and raised it up and blessed it and broken it and handed it to them to eat and say, take and eat, this is my body. That had never happened in all their years of Passover going. And nobody had ever taken the Elijah cup, the cup which was meant to symbolize that Elijah would return before the end of time. It's a way of people understanding that God would bring about the salvation of Israel before things were finished. No one had ever taken that cup and raised it up and blessed it and said, drink from this. This is the new covenant my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. Nobody had ever done anything like that. How could they not be talking about that. It was such an incredible, different, new experience for them. And probably they talked about going to the garden with Jesus, just as they usually did. That was Jesus' practice. That's how he knew right where to go for prayer. And they went with him, and then they lost their nerve when the soldiers came to arrest him. And they must have talked over how afraid they were and how they fled. Don't you know that when people die, the things that we're guilty about in our relationship with them just comes percolating up to the surface? Can't you imagine them speaking about that? But I think mostly they would have been talking about the terror of the crucifixion, this thing that their master and loved one had gone through. Such a horrible experience. 
They must have said, how could such a good man die like that? You know, there's a little part of us in our brains that we sort of think good people shouldn't die at all, much less to die in such a terrible way. Or maybe more to the point they were saying to this, themselves, how could such a religious person die in such a way? They would have all been familiar with the Deuteronomy text which says, if you die on a tree, you are cursed by God. They would have known the teaching of their time which said, if you die on a cross, you will be forever forsaken from God. God will never redeem you. You will not be raised in the final resurrection. <coughs> Can you imagine? Can you even imagine? what it would be like to face the death of someone you loved without the slimmest hope that they might be going to heaven. I mean, this is worse than not even believing in heaven because then you could still hope for a last-minute conversion, right? This was an edict from the scripture itself that said if you die this way, you will never be reconciled to God. Can you think of anything worse? <coughs> And they must have been worrying because for years, Jesus had been their spiritual mentor, the one who told them what they could believe and how to believe it, and the one who opened up the scriptures to them, and the one who taught them what God was like. And now he was dead, and not only was he dead, but he was going to be forever forsaken from God. What could they believe? It must have set up inside them a worry about all the things that they thought they could trust no longer being trustworthy. How could they ever trust anything again? Wouldn't they always be filled with doubt about the truth of what people were telling them? And you know, wouldn't they always just feel like they're not completely whole? You know, death, even when it is expected and normal, leaves us with a sense that we can't make sense of the world. Leaves us with the idea, the feeling that we're something missing in us that we're not really completely whole, and maybe we wonder if we will ever be whole again. How much worse it was for them, <coughs> because their loved one died in such a terrible way. No wonder Jesus is the topic of conversation as they walk along. Well, Luke tells us that it is into this emotionally charged moment that the risen Christ comes. Now, it's interesting, don't you think, that nobody ever seems to notice that he just appears out of nowhere. Where did he come from? They don't even ask the question. They don't seem to worry about it. And they also, it's clear, don't recognize him. He doesn't look strange to them. He's not a ghost. All of the gospel writers make a really big deal out of the fact that Jesus is not a ghost when he's raised from the dead. This is real stuff. It's not imaginary. It's not the sort of thing that... Um, television movies are made of. This is real stuff. There's something real about Jesus, but they don't recognize him. And Jesus chides them a little bit. I love, he says, you're a little slow. Isn't that cute? I think that's wonderful. Jesus says, you're a little slow on the uptake here. You don't quite get it. You don't quite understand. Aren't we a little slow sometimes when it comes to God? And I wonder how often we have missed the presence of the living Christ because we're looking for something else or we're not really expecting that Christ will be among us. And then Jesus begins to teach them. It must have been something like what he had always taught them. Still, they don't recognize him. They don't recognize his voice and they don't recognize his style for teaching. Now think about that for a minute. I would just about guarantee that if I went behind those walls in the sacristy and started to speak the way that I'm speaking now, even though you couldn't see me, you would be very likely to recognize me because you would recognize my voice and you would recognize the style that I use when I speak. But they don't recognize him. No wonder Jesus thinks that they're a little slow on the uptake. Of course, we get the insider knowledge that God is preventing them from understanding that this is Jesus until just the right moment. And finally, they get to Emmaus, and Jesus looks like he's going to go on, and they invite him to come in and stay with them. Now, you don't have to think that that was something unusual. You don't have to think that they went above and beyond the call of duty. That was hospitality. That's what every Jewish person would have understood that you do in that situation. But what you should notice there is what difference it makes when they just simply invite him in. Because I think that's powerful for us. 
What difference does it make when you just invite Jesus into your life? If you wonder why your faith is not as good as it should be, or you wonder why you don't always seem to be so enthused about Jesus, have you just stopped and invited him to come into your heart? Because it seems like it makes a pretty big difference. In all of these places in the scripture, when people invite Jesus in, it just transforms their lives. So be open to what God is doing. And then, you know, had they failed to invite him in, they would have missed the meal, the time in which he was revealed to them, in the breaking of the bread and in the sharing of the cup. And had they missed that, they would have missed the greatest event that God had ever done in human history. They would have not been open to the presence of the Christ in their midst. And once they see who he really is, then he's gone because he has accomplished what he desired to accomplish, to reveal the future to them. They can't help themselves. They have to go. They have to be transformed. It changes everything for them. Sarah Miles, in her book, Take This Bread, talks about her journey in coming to know Christ. There's a lot of things in the book that I don't particularly like, but I love the story of the Eucharist that she tells. Sarah says she was in a really dark place in her life. Her um, daughter's father had left them. Her best friend died of AIDS. A couple weeks later, another friend died. And then her father, who had never been sick a day in his life, never even been to the hospital, was diagnosed with lymphoma and died four days later. And she was just despondent. Everything was wrong in her world. Now understand that that kind of burden of stuff didn't sort of send her to the Lord because unlike, I mean, that might be what we would do, but Sarah had been raised in a strictly atheistic home. So in a way that some homes are very strictly Christian, her home was strictly a home of atheists. So she didn't even believe in all this stuff. But she said one day she was walking down the street and she passed a church and she heard that there was a service going on in there and she just doesn't even know why, but she went into the service. She just went in. And she said she didn't know what they were doing. In the first place, there was a man and a woman dressed in a white robe. What was that about? And then they were speaking, and there wasn't an organ or a piano, but the whole thing was sort of punctuated with periods of people speaking and then silence. What was that about? and then singing without uh, musical instruments. She just didn't know what was going on. And not only that, but they stood up and sat down at mysterious times. But she just went along with it and kind of watched what was happening. She said all of a sudden she noticed that there was a table kind of in the middle of the front, and it had a white cloth on it, and there was some pottery sitting on the table. She didn't know what that was about, but all of a sudden she heard the woman say, everyone is invited to the table of the Lord. So when everyone else went, she went. She said before she knew it, someone was pressing a crumbly piece of bread into her hand, and she ate it. And someone handed her a cup of wine, and she took a drink. And she said something incredible happened to her. She doesn't even know how to explain it. To this day, she cannot explain to you what happened other than to say Jesus happened to her. Something just jolted her soul alive. Within a year, she was baptized, and she had already organized and started a food pantry in that church. When you are in the presence of the risen Christ, everything changes, because, friends, Christianity is not just believing. It's letting what you believe change you. And no wonder those two people couldn't stay with what they'd heard. They had to go tell, because it also motivates your witness once you know the truth of the risen Christ, you cannot keep it to yourself. You just have to get on your feet and get moving to tell a broken world what's out there for them, which is so powerful, so transformative, so life-giving. Harry Fostick was one of the most famous preachers of his time. Most people don't know, however, what a very difficult time he had in his younger years. <clears throat> When he was in seminary, he had been working at a mission in New York City, 
and it about depleted him of all of his energy and strength. It was just what he had to see there was just more than he could manage. So he went home to be with his folks for a period of time, and he really fell into a really deep depression. He describes that one day he was in the bathroom looking at himself in the mirror, and he was holding one of those old-fashioned razors, you know, to shave a beard with, and he was holding it to his throat, and he was thinking to himself how easy it would be to just cut his throat, to end his life, and he really could hardly think of any reason not to do it. And he said all of a sudden, from the other room, the room next door to him, he heard his father call out, Harry, Harry. He said his father's voice was like the voice of God, and it jolted him into remembering that his life belonged to God. It was not his to end. And from that came this powerful ministry and this incredible capacity for preaching. Because when you are in the presence of the risen Christ, everything changes, and you cannot keep it to yourself. Today we remember, we are reminded of the death and resurrection of Jesus, and that is God's voice calling to us, come to me, you belong to me. That is God calling out your name. I pray for you that you will let the power of the death and resurrection of Jesus be God calling you and that you will believe it and that in believing your life will change because I know that when it does, your life will be full and fulfilled. Let it be so among us.